Welcome, my name is Xenophon Babadimitris. I'm a professor in biomedical informatics and data science here at Yale. What you're watching is a video that's part of our new certificate program in medical software and medical AI. We will bring experts from industry to give us more information about the various topics. Our guest today is Bernhard Happe, who is the CEO and founder of Orthogonal, who is a medical device software consulting company. And you know, I've come across your work through publications on Agile, and I guess we're going to talk about Agile today as a strategy for developing software and perhaps even managing a company as a whole. So Bernhard, welcome. Tell us a little bit about you and your company and what you guys do. Yeah, so I've been in software development for about uh, 30 years, worked in various areas. At some point, I moved to Seattle. And as uh, many people do uh, who are in software development, uh, I ended up working for Microsoft uh, for a while uh, on Excel, Excel pivot tables, things like that, uh, and eventually branched out, started my own software company, uh, sold that off, and then... Um, uh, eventually found my way into uh, working on medical devices, and that's when we uh, founded Orthogonal. Uh, and Orthogonal uh, is headquartered in Chicago. Uh, we do work uh, for medical device companies. We build uh, and test and run uh, connected device systems. So uh, a lot of what we do ends up being mobile and cloud connected uh, to devices. Uh, everything from continuous glucose monitors and insulin pumps to uh, spinal cord nerve stimulators, surgical planning, robots, kind of the gamut uh, of uh, software systems uh, in medical devices. Let's talk a little bit about Agile first. Uh, I mean, I, that's how I came across your work, actually. I was looking at Agile and FDA medical devices. So what's Agile? What do we really mean about it? It means a million things to different people. So what is your take on what Agile is? So I, I think the best way to explain it is first kind of starting with what the problem is that Agile initially was developed for. Um, and so, and the problems that really Agile is meant to address. So when you're designing, building something, right, there are situations where you can't know everything in advance. You're building something new, you're adding something new, and certainly in software, that happens a lot, right? We are building new systems uh, very often, and the way we used to do this uh, when we were building buildings, certainly early days of software, a lot of what we were doing was really analyzing as much as we can up front and then sort of following a waterfall style of building, uh, uh, building these things. But the reality is you don't know everything up front uh, and you're going to find something new along the way. And uh, so the idea is that really what you're doing is not just sort of doing that big analysis up front. It is better to actually do small bits of analysis, do some work, and get feedback on it. And that's really the core of it. It's a fast feedback loop process, like a whole bunch of other processes that you know, from the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, really emerged. Everything from uh, OODA loops to uh, lean manufacturing, Toyota production system, all of these things were about going to the source and getting feedback and quickly adjusting based on that. Um, and so for software development, where this, is, this really uh, uh, agile practice has started, you have a small team, uh, a core team uh, that is really sort of working towards an objective and they are kind of making the decisions on what they are doing uh, because they're close to the source, right? And so they do things in small cycles. Typically, you know, they're called sprints or iterations. They can be a week long, two weeks long, too much longer than that. And you don't really have fast feedback lights. A fast feedback cycles. Uh, and so then, you know, you're building something, measuring, adjusting continuously uh, along the way. So, you know, they can create value in short increments for for the, uh, the end users and then potentially, you know, release something earlier 
as long as there's enough value uh, rather than this big, long process where you find adjustments happening very late and it's much, much more expensive to do those adjustments late in the process. And where do people find the benefits? I mean, clearly it's a better way to sort of organize projects. Are there financial benefits that people come up with? Is there studies that show that? Little... Absolutely. What lots of clients see when they adopt this kind of thing? Yeah, lots of studies. There certainly have been, you know, a whole series of, uh, of studies on kind of the benefits of Agile. So, you know, I mean, it follows out of the fact that it is much, much easier to make adjustments early in a process than later in a process, right? And so what you end up with uh, is typically you end up with better products. You also end up with less waste uh, and less wasted effort. So, you know, it's it's faster, <laughs> it's cheaper, and it's better. Really, that's what you end up with through Agile processes. Okay, so when we think about, I mean, if you're telling me about Agile, and for most people listening here, in an internet company, right, we develop a product, we talk about it tonight, we call it tomorrow, we release it two days from here, and that's fine. In the regulated space, when we have something like the FDA between us and our customers in many cases, obviously, that's not exactly how things would function. So what are the adjustments or, like, how does this thing map into a regulated world where... You know, certain things, validation, paperwork, et cetera, are kind of non-negotiable here. Right, right. And so there is, is you know, the uh, a, a, a certain, let's say, historical uh, impedance between the regulations and how Agile has worked. And that that has a lot to do with when the regulations and the standards were originally written, right? They were written before Agile was even a concept and before software was um, was really that big a part of, uh, of medical devices. Uh, and so they wrote it, you know, in a very waterfall way. It's also a lot easier to write, first you do this, then you do this, then you do this, as opposed to you do all of this in fast feedback loops and, you know, uh, build it out incrementally, which is sort of the, you know, the agile concept. Um, and so that has been this sort of impedance mismatch between really, uh, you know, how the medical device world thought, uh, thought of things, one that it was very much hardware centric uh compared to agile practices uh which were very much uh software centric so uh that really has been yeah, meant that it took a lot longer to get agile practices into medical devices because not because someone like the fda necessarily said you can't use agile uh but because uh, there was no real good guidance uh, around that, right? And so in a lot of ways, it, it, the medical device industry was probably about 10 years behind other <laughs> industries in terms of adopting agile practices uh, for software. The industry also has had to figure out, okay, how do we do deal with these other constraints that we have, right? As you said, you know, there's risk management. We care about patient uh, patient risk, we want to manage that as part of our process. Uh, the regulations and standards also really call for pretty rigorous documentation and verification and validation and documentation of those efforts that you can trace and document and show to a regulator that you know you've kept the patient safe. This thing meets the needs, uh, uh, its intended use, and it it functions the way uh, you have intended it to function. So that's that's kind of the the difference, right? You have to add some more things to your practices. It doesn't mean you have to abandon agile. You just have to incorporate those constraints into your agile practices. It sort of feels to me that what we're looking at here is some kind of sandwich almost, right? There's some planning that has to happen ahead of time because you need to figure out who your users are, clinical scenario, all of that things. Then there is the fast iteration phase, sort of the middle of the project. But then there is like the final validation where it's the fixed final thing where you're no longer changing code anymore. And 
that also needs to be planned ahead of time because you have to have the patient data, the hospitals, the, 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 the all of those things that go into that. Actually, a question I have for you as you implement this thing, and as people come from outside medtech, who know a lot about Agile, they come into a medical company, how do they deal with all the documentation requirements? Like, is that like a cultural issue or is it something that just comes naturally to them as well? Like, <laughs> I think it's absolutely a, a, a cultural issue. I think um, the, uh, right, there, this impedance mismatch exists in a lot of companies. You have people who are used to agile practices, but agile, there are a lot of ways of practicing agile, right? There are sort of, you know, disciplined software engineering practices, and there's also cowboy agile, right? Where we don't need to do anything, let's just go build something, et cetera, right? And I think if you come from a uh, a more disciplined school or you, you've experienced more disciplined agile where you're doing things like test driven development, behavior driven design, uh, test automation, et cetera. Those are things are much more compatible with at least, you know, what you should be doing for, for the medical device side of things. At the same time, you, you know, a lot of people, in th in areas like quality, in regulatory, even product management within a medical device company, aren't used to agile practices, right? And aren't used to those fast feedback loops. And so you you know, uh, as I think you've said yourself, very often there is sort of this <laughs> language barrier, and there's a lack of common understanding. So it's uh, it, it can be a real culture shock. Um, for both sides, frankly, uh, when you have suddenly the need to do modern software development practices where, uh, you know, the pressure is to move faster and get changes out faster because companies that adopt agile practices are, are able to do that while staying compliant. So it's, it's definitely an area uh, where... I think a lot of medical device companies uh, struggle or even startups when they are bringing these two sets of people uh, together where maybe they can create new practices. They have to learn to work well with each other. When we're talking about design before the talk, you also mentioned that for Agile to really help you, you need to get beyond software engineering. Right? It doesn't really do you much good if you Again, in the medical device world, the software part is a small part of the process, unfortunately. We think of it as we want to write software, but no, there's a million and one other things on top of the software that have to happen. So how does Agile integrate into that? I mean, do you get your regulatory people to be Agile and your quality people to be Agile? How does that process function? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I think, again, this is, this is more of a uh, culture process, how do you get that happening? Ideally, yes, that is what you want to do. Because if you think about sort of the, the circumstances that a medical device company that has a lot of software finds itself in, agile practices really are super helpful, right? But if what you have is just agile fast feedback loops only on the software development side of things, then, you know, uh, the idea of Agile is you can take inputs throughout the process and provide outputs and adjust along the way. If you're only doing that for your software team, you're kind of doing this at half or quarter speed. You're going to get some internal things that are useful, but if you're not taking this out and saying, let's go get feedback quickly from our end users. Uh, let's go uh, get feedback quickly from the market. Let's, after we release our first software, keep getting feedback from the market uh, and from our end users uh, and uh, in terms of the clinical uh, efficacy of, of our products and use that to continuously improve our products, you're going to fall behind uh, other people. Right. So I think you have to extend 
fast feedback loop practices, whether you call it agile or not, <laughs> uh is is a is a different uh is a different story right for things like human factors and user experience the term outside of the medical device space is you know lean ux where really you're taking agile practices and getting frequent fast feedback on your designs both qualitatively and quantitatively and then bringing that into your development process the same can be applied to you know marketing to other things things like lean startup etc are also based on fast feedback loop that you can use but it requires a change in how all of these other groups both interact with your development process but also how they work internally that's hard to do for a certainly for a large medical device company where most people have been in medical devices uh, for, you know, for a long time, and this is what they know, they don't know what it's like in a different industry. Unlike the software developers who, you know, they're, <laughs> what they do travels to other <laughs> industries, and they've probably been exposed to things outside of medical devices. Mm -hmm. So when you guys go into a company, right, so they just hire you, they want to implement Agile, what are like the two, three first things you need to Get especially companies more traditional as a medical device company. What are the two, three first things that I don't know? Maybe the first points of friction or the first couple of things that you need to introduce into them to get them moving from old to new in some ways. Yeah, it's. I mean, you know, uh, obviously when you do this, you need to have you know upper management buy-in. It, that's the first thing. So uh, I wouldn't attempt to go into a company and start bottom up uh, uh, on this stuff because there are hard things that have to happen. So really, that's the first thing. Do you have upper management buy-in and do they know what they're getting into, right? Uh, but then, you know, as you go through it, very often um, it is folks on the quality side or at least the system uh that they have built up that can be a point of friction right so uh we look at that and we look at how a quality management system has been uh set up very often they um they have been uh set up in such a way that uh that agile practices or sort of optimization that agile allows uh, aren't really uh, really considered, right? So as an example, uh, I've run across a company uh, before where uh, their process for any kind of software change uh, involved an approval process where 20 people had to be physically in a room to approve this, right? And that doesn't even work <laughs> if you have a connected device and the FDA wants you to do cybersecurity updates and patches very quickly, right? Um, and so th those have, you know, people have adjusted to those things, but there are still uh, both things in the quality management system and in the processes for approval that are, um, uh, that really are inefficient in, in that way. Uh, the, the other part I think that is, a big friction is again from an agile in an agile approach you have decisions being made by the core team the people that are know what they need to do they're in it they're seeing it every day but if they don't have the expertise say someone who really understands risk management and clinical risk evaluation etc do people that aren't often directly involved in it, then again, you can have this impedance mismatch if those people aren't brought in, not just at the beginning, at the end, but throughout the process. That's a big change in how those people work because, and human factors folks are the same. They're used to big up front, big in the end, and then don't bother me in between. You now have a different way of working uh, and having to sort of, you know, see this as it's being uh as it's being developed as opposed to just at the beginning at the end if you just do beginning and end what you end up with is a you know a whole bunch of adjustments late you're sort of an agile anti-pattern oh we didn't 
if we'd known this ahead of time, <laughs> then we would have told you this, but we didn't. And so, uh, so that's, that's really the hardest thing to do is get those groups working together, get those other people, uh, working with the, uh, with the development team. Um, I think this, the other one is really, if you have a lot of kind of software developers who maybe aren't used to agile practices, right? Very often firmware developers, uh, again, are, have been specialized with this, within this group. They're very sort of, you know, connected to hardware, et cetera. And so they, so you have developers or teams potentially that need to interface with a, uh, a software development team that's building mobile and cloud and web, et cetera. And you have this impedance mismatch again, between the two, uh, the two things where they're not used to working on those same sort of small adjustment time scales. I mean, you mentioned cybersecurity. To me, it's very interesting because if we think about cybersecurity as something that needs fast updates, mandated fast updates, not just you need them, you have them. When I look at things like AI technologies coming in where you're going to have to keep monitoring the system because it's never validated, it's almost like you have to be agile. It's not like it's a nice thing to do. You have to be like the era that you produce something and you send it out and that was it. You get feedback every six months, it's over. Right. right. We, are right. The, we are now the market is making us be on the treadmill, whether it's the market, the external world, whether it's cybersecurity, whether it's new AI things, with new data drift that are breaking your system. Like you have to be able to constantly monitor and update. Otherwise, you can't survive. And you know, cloud infrastructure is the same thing, right? As things beyond your Basically, you can't control the world anymore, which means that you have to be right. constantly reacting to it, right? It's, it's kind of what I'm seeing. Yeah, exactly. I, I think cloud is a great example, right? Because very often we're we're building things on top of the cloud. Uh, the cloud is constantly evolving. There's good reasons to build things on top of the cloud. You're going to be more secure than if you were building things on top of your own data center. You have more power, more flexibility, all of, all of the benefits of the cloud. Um, but it's also again, a somewhat different paradigm than the regulations have have really, and standards have uh, accommodated. It's kind of uh, what we had with, with Agile, but on steroids, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're currently uh, very close uh, to publishing uh, new guidance uh, through uh, uh, Amy on cloud computing in medical devices. And uh, and really, that's the central problem is that this is not static. You can't even sort of take a static snapshot of this and say, this is what we are building on and it's going to stay this way until we change it. You don't have control over that anymore. And when we were originally talking to the... Um, to Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, et cetera, when we brought them onto the committee, we had this idea that what we could do is just have them tell us what changes they were making and when those changes were being made. And then we could go do our validation and have this kind of always in a validated state. And they said, we can certainly do that, but you realize that there are thousands of changes happening every hour mm -hmm. and there is no way that a person can analyze this <laughs> and manage this that's not how it's done it's really the computers are managing it the safeguards are all uh through automated uh procedures and through rollbacks when there are issues and a ton tons and tons of fail safes and more and more so it's a very different paradigm that you have to deal with uh in that case AI is very much in the in the same realm, at least the direction that, uh, that we are going with it. Uh, and again, it's really difficult as a regulator to figure out how you keep patients safe uh, with you know with all of this fast change that is happening. Right, and of course, the benefits of these things are huge. So it's not like you're going to say. We are not going to use AI because it doesn't fit into the old paradigm. Right, right. right. We're not yes. going to stay in the 20th century or the 19th century, regardless. Uh, Brendan, 
thanks for all of this. I think this, people will find it useful. Anything else you wanted to mention or any pointers you want to give people for further reading or how to get educated here? Where does one go from here? Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of good reading material out there. We certainly write uh, uh, quite a few things ourselves. Our, our the orthogonal blog. We also have a number of uh, ebooks and white papers on agile. Uh, if you go to orthogonal.io, and we, will, and, we will add links, and we will add links to that in the notes behind below the video too. Yes, perfect. And then there's, uh, uh, I think. Kind of in terms of the standards and guidance, uh, the best thing to look at is Amy TIR 45 uh, on the use of agile practices in medical device software. Uh, I think that uh, that is a great document. It was recently updated actually in 2023, but originally published in 2013. And the FDA has recognized that as a consensus standard. Um, and uh, it really sort of, if you're coming from a medical device world, it really explains things very well because it integrates in with IEC 62304 and ISO 1345, which are, you know, kind of core standards for uh, medical device development and for medical device software. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for coming on board. Oh, I have, I have one more, which is if you are not coming from uh, from the agile world and not even from the software world, there is a game called the Agile Lego game, uh, which people use to teach agile practices. Uh, you can look it up and there's YouTube videos of how people uh, uh, do this. We actually uh, ha at some point had uh, one of our um, project managers who knew how to do this do a big uh, Agile Lego game. Awesome for just sort of getting the idea of Agile and actually a ton of fun as well. Hello. That's great. I will look. I'll look into that for my own actually classes too. Thank you. We're going to stop recording.